I see some counselors and some ICs that I know are on here. But if you're a parent, put in the year, the grad, the high school graduation year for the child that I know you probably have younger kids, but potentially, but for the child you're on for, just so Matt and I can get a sense of uh, who we got on here. Okay, so we got some 23, so a lot of seniors. As expected, is, largely just about. Um, so 25 and coupled some 24s. Okay. 24s, yeah. That just helps us to, to know what to focus on a little bit more here and there. So thank got you. Some twins, that. Peggy. We got some twins for you in the house. They are so common. Just when I had them, not as common it was quite a few years ago. Their age now. Yep, it's all the rage, that's for sure. All right. I think we can kick off here, Carpy. It's three after, so. Let's do it. You want to? Yeah, so welcome. We'll do quick intros, but today our focus is really going to be talking about private scholarships and other ways to get money because honestly, private scholarships make up about 6% of the money that families get. I know it's a big buzzword and it's a thing and it's out there. So we want to give you some tips and tricks on that, but we also want to fill you in on where other money can come from. And then also, since we have a lot of 23s on here this time of year, no matter what, we're always going to touch on appeals a little at the end because we want all you parents with seniors to understand you know, there's steps in this journey and you're getting to the end. This is the fun part, right? Matt and I always say that, like your kids are getting in and you're getting award letters. And so it's, it, to me, it's a lot more fun than filling out financial aid forms and filling out admission applications. So we're getting to the fun part for your senior parents. You're getting there. You're not done yet. There's a few more steps in the process, but that's what we're going to hit on today. We are, and I'll share my deck for a minute so you can see, but we're College Aid Pro, and I used to have my own business, Way to the Quad, so a lot of you guys know me through that, and I joined College Aid Pro in 2021, but truly, our mission is to end student loan crisis by empowering parents, to sh families, not just parents, to shop smarter for college, and what that really means to me is we're trying to educate parents so they're informed consumers, so if you understand this process, which is a complex, crazy process, that's that's why I shifted my career back in 2014 and started my own business. Because when my kids hit high school, I realized how complex it was. And I saw how many parents just didn't have the bandwidth or the interest to dedicate time to it. And I saw that as a place I could really impact families even more. I was doing financial planning at the time. But really, that's our mission. And it's really powerful. We were just talking to school counselors yesterday. If we can really get everybody educated, then you can be proactive as families in this process instead of reacting to the colleges and what they say you need to pay. And that's really our whole focus. Matt, you want to take a minute? I can go off share so people can see you. Take a minute and just introduce yourself because I don't know. Yeah, sure. Talking. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah my name's Matt Carpenter, great to meet everybody that I guess we're interfacing with for the first time. I, I see a lot of familiar faces on here as well, so good to see you. Again, as always, I'm up here in the Boston area, but born and raised in just north of Boston originally, and I haven't gone too far from the original stomping grounds here. And <clears throat> I've been really in this space for my entire career, right? Almost immediately after I graduated from college, I saw this as an opportunity and what I wanted to do and just guide other people through this process. So they avoided mistakes that I made and my parents made and my siblings made in navigating this thing. And that's really the only professional language I speak. For those of you that follow along, Peg and I do this almost every day. And even when we're not in front of an audience, we this is what we're doing every day behind the scenes and trying to get ourselves more educated and share everything that we know with anybody that'll listen, essentially, because we're both, I think you probably heard it, come through with Peg, but just about everybody on our team, hopefully everybody, are pretty passionate about this mission. And, uh, and that's what we like to uh, preach about. And this particular piece of the puzzle, private scholarships, I think, like Peg said, huge buzzword, a lot of intrigue. People want to know what's going on. But part of what we're going to you're going to hear today is cutting through the noise a little bit. And maybe it's not great news to hear. Oh, but I thought I was going to tune in and hear where this hidden treasure chest is. And we hear all these stories of people getting huge amounts of money through these unknown scholarships and 
I think more of that is myth than what happens in reality, but hopefully we're going to do two things that are, that I think are big positives. Number one, just set you straight. What are the right expectations? What are the do's and don'ts? What can we expect to get out of this? And then assuming we do want to put some effort in, where do we focus those efforts? But that's what we're here to do today and excited to be here. All right. So let's, let's kick this off. There we go. There we are. And sorry, sometimes my PowerPoint doesn't want to. So you, everybody should have received an email saying, encouraging you to set up your free MyCap account. So this is our software. If you didn't, that's fine. It'll be one of our keep the ball rolling call to actions at the end. Really important. It's free to set up. It tells you your EFC. So even if you're a senior parent, these expected family contributions are important to understand. I'm going to touch on them in a minute just for... And I just put the link in the, if you haven't created your account, I just put the link in the, in the chat there. Yeah, because you'll be able to continue to use this as you get financial aid award letters and upload them and get visibility. So you can think about appealing and just understanding if you got a good award, which is is next step in the process for you seeing your parents. And for parents that have younger kids, this is great to hear because there's a lot of information you hear it a couple of times. It'll help solidify your learning on it. So let's just quickly, very high level, real quick, talk about financial aid and just how it works. Okay. All these colleges are discounting their sticker price. Another way to get a discount is to find these private scholarships. And I love private scholarships to fill the gap. So basically in an ideal world, you're trying to find endowment money and then wherever those gaps are, then you could potentially fill them with private scholarships and minimize the amount that comes out of your pocket is the ideal scenario in my mind. So what colleges are doing is either offering need-based grants, so you have to have financial need, or merit-based scholarships. And sometimes they play around with the words grants and scholarships, and it's not always in those categories. So just FYI on that. But the merit-based is based on merit. It's based on grades, test scores, leadership, talent, right? It has nothing to do with your ability to pay. And then that last bucket that colleges will discount with is what we call the self-help. So that's going to be loans and work study. So it's not free. It's not free money. You got to pay it back or you got to work to earn it. But those are the buckets. And that basically very high level is how financial aid works and this discounting with the colleges. So need-based aid is very simply done. There's a very simple equation. Cost of attendance, which is this sticker price that we know has been going up and up for decades, tuition fees, room and board books, and personal expenses slash travel. Then they take this expected family contribution. And when you set up your free MyCap account, you'll see your three EFC estimates. That's just the tip of the iceberg for understanding all of this. And it's important for all the parents on here, if you're trying to evaluate award letters or if you're guiding your child building a list, they take that expected family contribution, what they think you can afford, and they take the difference and that's your need. So if that's zero or a negative number, which it is for decent amount of families, you don't have any need-based eligibility. If you do, great. That's a way to get those need-based grants that I talked about. So that's super high level, how financial aid works with the discounting and then the need-based. So the next question is, and if people might be thinking, well, yeah, Peg, I know my EFCs are super high. So I don't qualify for need-based aid. So where do you turn from there? So that's going to be merit scholarships. That's going to be fill in the gap with private scholarships outside scholarships. So Matt, you want to uh, take over from here? Yeah. So I think it's important, again, when we're here to talk about private scholarships, and obviously that's what our core content is going to be in, in just a minute here. But in our opinion, it would be a little bit irresponsible not to talk about scholarships from the colleges themselves, even though I know most of you on here are class 2000. 23 families and you're already down this path. But I just want to reiterate that by far, when we talk about scholarships, the bigger, the biggest piece of the pie is not the private scholarships, it's the scholarships from the colleges themselves. Now, for you underclassmen, you have plenty of time to put together a list of schools where you're confident and likely to receive merit-based scholarships. 
Whereas again, for our 23s, we might be too far down that road to add schools to the list at this point, although there are plenty of options still available for that. But there are some things that I want you to understand and some seeds that I want to plant as we start to think about this appeal process, which again, we'll end, we'll end with today. But if I can, Peg, it might be helpful to sh share my screen quick. Uh, again, for those of you that, that have your accounts, you recognize this as your home dashboard and you have your EFCs staring at you in the face, kind of front and center that are that foundation of need-based eligibility or lack thereof. But a couple of things that you may not be aware of that I think are important when it comes to scholarships specifically. Now for any college in the country, if you put them into the platform here, number one, we're going to project what type of discounts, if any, do we anticipate you getting, right? And this is smart family here in the Massachusetts area. They're going to get a $30,000 discount from St. Anselm's, okay, which is a, a little private school up here in New Hampshire, great little private school. But another thing that I just want to make sure that you have at your disposal is that in addition to projecting the amount that we anticipate you getting from a given school, you can get some more information as to the why, right? And okay, based on my kid's GPA and test scores, if they're submitting those, this makes sense. And I get where this student is above average. So we're getting more than the average, right? And this tab is where we're going to tell you, here's the average award that a family typically gets specifically from a merit-based scholarship. And that can be really important because if your kid doesn't get it, that could be great grounds for an appeal. So you might have, as you start to get some of these acceptances and award letters back, you can check to see what's the average award at these colleges. Did my kid get below it? Great. That could be a great foundation to go back to them and say, hey, we got below average. You make your case there. Or did they get less than we projected you to get? We're very good at projecting. Okay. Our algorithm takes in a lot of secret sauce, but a big piece of it are the college's net price calculators themselves. So basically we're able to come back and say, hey, you guys told us basically, your net price calculator said we were gonna get 20,000, we only got 15, we'd like to appeal for an additional five. So I think it's an important thing to note that before we get into private scholarships, let's make sure that we're squeezing all as much juice as possible out of an even bigger resource, which is from the college colleges scholarship funds themselves. Okay. And we'll come, we'll probably jump back in here towards the end when we talk about specifically how to appeal for more scholarship dollars or just appeal in general. But I wanted to share some of that at the top here before we get into the task at hand. Okay. All right. Let me go back here. All right, so let's pop back in. And again, you guys are getting the slides. So we've got a couple slides about Merit Aid in here to get kind of school you up on that. You will get those slides. So we're not going to spend time on that. So let's dive in to private scholarships. This is our overall, and then I'm going to go into some tips and tricks. So as far as how this works and who should own this process. Some of this is going to fall on family decisions, but really it, students are going to be handling applications, essays, so depending on the private scholarship, they're going to have requirements of how to apply for it, right? So that's going to fall on the students sometimes, and you're, they, there might be some minimal financial questions that parents will have to handle and not and often you're going to have to have done the FAFSA. So Matt and I preach all day, every day that every family should be submitting the FAFSA. This is yet another reason why, if you are going to start looking for private scholarships in this point of the process with the senior, which is the typical time that families are looking at them, if you submitted that FAFSA, check, you met that requirement for the private scholarships. Most of the deadlines for private scholarships are right now. We're in that sweet spot. They're December of senior year through March. And then they're typically awarded May or June. I'm going to show you at the end, give you a URL for a private scholarship that I've known about for several years that I tell all my families, they're an anomaly. There's a deadline junior year and the beginning of senior year, but most private scholarships, it's now. This is when the applying is happening and the decisions are made in a couple months. So really, we're trying to quantify if you're thinking, well, like, how much work is this going to be? 
I, and again, this is average and this is from our experience with the families we've worked at. If you're going to put in about 10 hours of work, you might expect to get one to three thousand dollars, right? You might do worse, you might do better. And the, and a big thing to realize if you are familiar with merit scholarships, you know that most of the college merit, it's guaranteed for four years, which is wonderful when you're doing that four-year cash flow. Private scholarships are typically not like that. So this is a process. I tell parents when I'm talking to them now, you know, it's going to be a side hustle for your child or your family to organize this. And they're in college, you're applying again. It's usually not apply once and, oh, I can count on that two, $3,000 every year for all four years. And the application process, it's similar to admissions. There's deadlines. You've got to stay on top of the deadlines. If you miss a deadline, you know, you're out of luck. Okay. So let's get into our tips and tricks. So I can speak from personal experience with my two. There are a lot of local scholarships. And if you have a senior, the counseling office is the best place to start. I know at my kids' public high school, there were a bunch of them. And my kids applied to them, not nearly, as one of our bullets here says, not nearly as competitive as the big private scholarships that we know all about. And sometimes not as competitive as some of these colleges and their competitive merit scholarships, to be honest. So it's easier money to get. So that's definitely a top to do off of this webinar is check in with the counseling office. See, like my son applied and got like a Windermere, which is a local realtor out here, real estate agency. And he got a thousand bucks. Well, it's a thousand bucks off of our sticker price for freshman year. And it wasn't that hard for him to get, right? Most of these are going on December through March. And if you can, which you can't always do, if your child gets an award, you can ask to have it paid to you by a check. So then you have more flexibility how you use it toward their education. In reality, in my experience, most scholarship um, scholarships, they're going to say, okay, where'd you decide to go to college? And they're going to send the money there. And then they might even tell the college half for first semester, half for second, basically comes right off of your bursar bill when it hits up in your child's portal. This is what you owe for this semester or this quarter. It'll just come off as a credit. That's typically what happens. But if you can ask for a check, that gives you more flexibility to maybe spend it toward a plane ticket for them to fly to school or whatever, whatever you decide. The next tip is here is to use our software because we do have a scholarship database in here with filters. So you can search the more detailed and unique of your search, the better, right? This is true if you're going to go to Google right? If you're an African American and you play the trumpet and you're interested in engineering, you might not find anything. That's pretty specific, but you get my point. You want to try and filter it down. There's a, there is free money out there, right? And it's just a matter of finding it. But we do recommend, and Matt said this yesterday in a webinar, we don't recommend that you upgrade and pay for our software just to get the private scholarship search engine. But if you do upgrade in our software from the free version, it's part of it. And so that's definitely a place to go look. And when Matt goes in there in a little bit, he'll just show you. It's just a tab in there. It's easy to find. Um, so that's that's cap. So tip number three, definitely when you're starting to do this, create a professional email, but create another email. You probably noticed when your kids took the PSAT that all of a sudden they're flooded with email, right? Because those email addresses are being shared with the colleges and now they're getting marketed to. So it's probably a good idea to create a professional email and that you make sure your kids, if you're really going into this, make sure your kids are checking their email at least once a week. I would say even more, honestly. And that's an important thing in general because colleges communicate that way. And I know with my two who are older now, they're done with college. Emails is antiquated way of communicating, but it is important that they don't miss, if they're doing an active private scholarship search, they don't miss an important email, asking for additional information or whatever that happens to be, or an email from the colleges once they're accepted. So it's a good practice anyways to be to make sure they're checking email. And if something's confusing to them, just say, just haven't forwarded to you. So the deadlines and organization. So this is, it's similar to applying to college, right? You're going to have all these, if you're really going great guns on this, you're going to have all these 
different private scholarships with different deadlines and different requirements. And also try not to recreate the wheel. If your child's got a bunch of great essays and short answer that they had to do for certain colleges, you've got all that work's been done. See if you can repurpose that because in a lot of, a lot of times you can, but you want to help your child. And so I know with my kids, I wanted to pull some where they were with everything. So I created a way where I could just go look at each school. We didn't do massive private scholarship major deal. We just hit the counseling office and did that piece that I shared. But if you're going to really get organized about this and get into this big time, I'd encourage a spreadsheet or something where you decide who's going to do which parts of it and really have your child or whatever you guys decide as a family, like dedicate so many hours a week to this. Because just like anything, if you put in the time, then it's more likely that you're going to get the results. And again, like I said earlier, this is probably going to be time every year, unless this is just, hey, we want to get a nice break freshman year, but then we'll figure it out. Because I will say, not tied to private scholarships, but there is money at the colleges for upperclassmen. My son got it. My nephew got it. A lot of kids in the families that I work for, work, that have worked with me, they find there's money. A professor might say, hey, apply for this. You're a great student. Or you walk, my son walked into the business office at IU at Kelly, just, and he said, mom, there's money. I'm a sophomore and he got five grand. So a little bit of a tangent on my part, but it ties into the theme here. You can't plan for that when you're making the decision and your four-year cash flow, but keep that in mind too. That's more free money that, that, that's out there. And a lot of kids, once they're in college, off their radar, and there is money out there. I've got personal and a lot of anecdotal evidence of that with the work that I do with families. I mentioned this earlier. If you haven't completed the FAFSA because you have a really high EFC and you decided you shouldn't, yada, just, we're not, I'm not going to get into all the reasons you should submit the FAFSA, but one is some schools require it for merit aid. So you want to make sure you're not leaving money on the table. But another good one is if it's part of a private scholarship application, you've got it done. Like I said earlier. So we really encourage you to submit the, for a myriad of reasons, that's just two of them right there. And if you want to chat with us about that or put a question in the chat, we can give you some of our other reasons because we're really passionate about everybody, everybody doing that for sure. Just to <clears throat> piggyback on that point, because we did get a few questions around on the, in the Q&A peg, but I think a lot of folks are concerned that if they complete the FAFSA, they're there thereby applying for financial aid. And what if that hurts their kids' chances of being accepted into colleges, right? There is a scenario where you can have your cake and eat it too here. You can say on the admissions applications and on the common app, right, that you're not applying for financial aid, okay, and still complete the FAFSA. And it will allow you to at least throw your hat in the ring for any of these private scholarships or again, some of the other reasons we like to do it are. It allows the student to be entitled to borrow up to $27,000 over the course of four years when they're in college that you can only have access to that pool of money if you complete the FAFSA. So again, if you're concerned about this, you not apply for financial aid, but still complete the FAFSA and get some of the benefits that come with that, right? A little bit confusing, I would imagine, but that's the truth. Yeah. And I tell people all the time, you know, if you're submitting the FAFSA so that your child is eligible for what's called the unsubsidized direct student loans that Matt was just referencing, those aren't need-based. So you're being completely honest. You're not applying for financial aid, but you want your child to have skin in the game. So you're going to bring those loans into the mix or they're part of your college funding strategy. It's not going to be the need-based ones. And so you're not being dishonest and saying, I'm not, but oh, I'm going to, I'm going to submit the FAFSA knowing I have a low EFC. You're not, that's not why you're submitting the FAFSA. You're doing it for these other reasons, which is completely legitimate. Okay, so I want to talk let, about- let me, let, me just, let me just clarify here, Peg, sorry, because one of the, had the question around applying for financial aid. They had been told by admissions offices that needing financial aid and applying financial aid can impact ED decisions. These need ED aware, decisions, yeah. these need aware families who have, by saying you're not completing financial aid, you are not going to get need-based financial aid, okay? Outside of that $27,000 loan that the, I told you the student is entitled to. So you are telling the financial aid offices that I am willing to pay full sticker price for all four years outside of that 
if you don't apply for financial aid, okay? But then in addition to that, you can still complete the FAFSA that makes you entitled to that loan and some of these private scholarships. But at the college, you're telling them, hey, we're willing to pay full sticker price. So that's just an important distinction there. Yeah, you're walking away from that need-based endowment money is the bottom line. And, and make sure before you do that, that you're doing it very intentionally with a lot of knowledge behind it. And some people, they are. So keep that in mind. And that could be true even if you're not applying ED because not line share of schools are not need blind. All right. So let me talk about this concept of scholarship displacement because we we would probably get a question about this. And it's we, something we have we've got a couple. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So great job guys to bring up this question. This is what happens when you get outside scholarships. As I said earlier, typically it's going to be sent directly to the college or university. So they're going to know there's this I call it an outside resource that's helping the student pay for school. So it can hurt what you receive from the college, meaning the college can pull back on their award. Not all the time. And I'll give you an example of when it happened to one of my students, families that I worked with. So it's not a definite, but it can happen. So this family, the daughter got into Stanford and she received a $15,000 Girl Scout award, which is awesome, right? Stanford meets 100% of need, and this family had some need. They were expected to pay about $45,000 a year. Stanford costs a lot more than that. So Stanford came in and gave them need-based grants, work-study, and subsidized student loans. So when the Girl Scout came in with this money, was, that's going to be sent to Stanford. So what most colleges will do is they'll say, okay, you have this money to pay for college. So it hits up in your account. We're going to start taking away from what we gave you. If And Stanford, like I said, meets 100% of need. What they don't do, which makes a lot of parents upset, and I get it, is the parents think, well, that's just going to lower my EFC. My child went out, did this hustle, got this money. Why doesn't that just come off my EFC? It just doesn't. It is what it is. At most schools, that's not how they're going to do it. So what they're going to do, and this is what Stanford did, is they're going to say, okay, we'll take away your loans. We'll take away your work study. If that still doesn't use up all the money you got in the outside scholarship or the private scholarship, we're going to start taking away what we awarded you. And so they took away a little bit of grant money I asked them to ask the Girl Scouts to cut it into freshman and sophomore year, which they did. So that softened the blow quite a bit because it came in two chunks instead of one. But just a heads up, because this can cause a lot of frustration. If you do all this work, you get the money, it gets sent to the college. And then all of a sudden, parents are like, we're not even ahead of the game because this happened. I will say, and knock on wood, I've never seen it, and I don't think Matt has, that when you get merit aid, which we're talking about today, they don't go and pull that away. And part of the reason is merit is given not based on need. It's Office of Admissions is giving it because they want to entice that family and that student to come. So it, I've never seen where they'll go into that provost scholarship and take some money away. In my example with Stanford, they don't give merit. So that wasn't, that wasn't even on the table to see how that works. But just make sure you understand that this is a possibility. You can always appeal it to. You can always have that conversation with the college. Like, hey, this is our situation. We were counting on this, What, whatever. You can have a conversation with them and reach out and appeal. There's a lot of reasons to appeal. And that is one. The worst thing they say is, sorry, you're stuck. And if you have a bunch of schools and a bunch of them do that, you can reach out and see how the different ones respond because they're just like everything in this process. The colleges don't all function the same. And depending on their yields and what's going on behind the scenes, they might be open to an appeal. Okay, well, we usually do this, but we won't do it this time or something like that, especially because private scholarships are typically one-offs, like I said. So it's not something that they're going to be revisiting every year with you because it's a one-time award for freshman year. Okay. This is, to me, one of the best private scholarships out there. I found this years ago, and I scream it from the mountaintops. So that you'll get these slides, as I said. So you'll have this URL. For seniors, the ship sailed. 
So the first deadline on this is May of junior year, and the second deadline for the same award is September of senior year. I strongly encourage all the families I talk to, get it in May, get it in earlier. They usually take 3,000 applications, and they've got 20 what they call Cameron Scholars. The reason why this is awesome is because it is like a merit award. It's for four years of full tuition and fees. Not room and board, but... <laughs> It's wonderful, right? That's the biggest part of the cost of attendance is the tuition and fees. It's a really cool program. It's competitive. The last time I looked, all you needed to have was a 3-7, but then you have to fit their profile and there's applications and there's a big process, right? But if you think your child could get it and if they look at it, it's definitely worth looking at. And you know what? In my mind, if your kid gets this, and the college pulls away some of the endowment money, whatever, this is awesome, right? You're, you, you, the colleges don't offer, they do offer merit or it's full tuition, very hard to get. And it's a great award to have. So definitely keep this, check this out for your family. If it's applicable to your child, you can dig in there and maybe apply if it makes sense. That's in our deck. We're not going to hit on that, but I would recommend you look at that. Matt, you want to take a few minutes? Yeah. We're good on time. So you want to take a few minutes to... To talk about appealing yeah i'll dig in here you know what i might do is share my screen first sure. and talk about where we start in in our kind of assessment for appeals right like how do we know when it's appropriate to go back to these guys or at least that we have a strong case with very few exceptions there is nothing wrong with appealing they're not going to say hey you guys are a pain you're getting greedy we're reneging our ad admissions you're, we're not going to let your kid come here anymore you don't run that risk, right? For the most part, the biggest risk that you run is you're out a little bit of sweat equity and these people say no. So with incredibly few exceptions, there is you have very little to lose and only to gain in appealing for additional scholarships and or need-based financial aid. Before I go right there, I just want to hammer home another point that to me is like the biggest takeaway for private scholarships in general. And did you peg, forgive me, I was busy, answering questions. we got a, a super active crowd today, which is great. But did you share that statistic that about 33% of the senior class will apply for local scholarships? I didn't say the 33%, okay. but I said that it's much less competitive than... Th that always just really class. resonated with me, right? Because to me, the biggest takeaway is when you go to focus your efforts on private scholarships, start locally. That's where you want to exhaust your efforts you want to go get more ambitious beyond that. And I'll show you what we have in our platform. If you want to go apply for private scholarships nationwide in a second here, by all means, go ahead, go crazy, but start locally. And again, it, because that's money that, that the, these communities have to give away each year. And it's just a much smaller pool. And again, if you make best efforts there, you're likely to have success. Okay. So going back into my cap here, now Peg mentioned the fact that we do have, we have a really robust private scholarship search engine. And, but I think what a lot of companies will do is say, Hey, pay us X amount. And we're going to make sure that you get access to all these private scholarships across the country and you're going to get X amount return on your investment. We're all pulling from the same date database here. Right. And yes, our private scholarship search engine is one of the features that's in our paid part of the platform. But we don't, and Peg said it earlier, we don't say, hey, you should invest in our platform just because of this. It's a great value add. But I think it's, I don't know, a little disingenuous to say that just for the private scholarships, you should be all over this. But this is essentially what it is, right? We have all these scholarships all over the country. But we can help get an idea of, okay, where should I apply? Where should I focus my efforts where I might be in a more realistic applicant pool? So I'm a mass resident. So right away I can figure out, okay, what scholarships are specific to Massachusetts? And I can just go poke around and maybe I want to, for example, one of the filters is I only want to apply for scholarships $5,000 or more because that's where I'm just going to go big or go home type of deal. But maybe I know what I might like to major in and maybe it's accounting. And now I know, okay, these are scholarships in, in, in my state that are the major worth thinking of pursuing. And maybe the student in question is, is a female. And while now we know that, hey, I'm a woman that, that, that wants to major in accounting and I'm a mass resident, there's probably a applicant pool here that is not crazy, right? So I, this might be a place that I might focus my effort. So that's just an example. And that's, I think, the 
appropriate thought process to have as you are um, as you're going after private scholarships. Again, start with the town, and then if you have our platform or if you use another platform, then that's how you want to think of drilling down on scholarships that it might be worth considering here. Okay, but to skip to the next part, you know where all. U23s are right now, you're starting to get some acceptances. Maybe you've got some full financial aid award letters. <clears throat> the first thing that we want to do that we encourage you to do here is upload your financial aid offer here. Okay. And if you've got some of these, that it is, these awards can be hard to. And hey, Carpy, can you just, because I know this came up yesterday, just clarify what you mean by financial aid award letter. So it's not just a merit award. Yeah, it is confusing, right, to that point. So uh, every school is different, like we say every day, but oftentimes you'll get accepted into the college. Congratulations, you've been accepted into in this, you know, we're staring at Northwestern here. And if you've been offered a merit-based scholarship, oftentimes that will come right with your acceptance. We're happy to accept you into the class 2027, and we're going to be offering you a $20,000 president scholarship right? A lot of times that scholarship will come with the letter or very close after within two weeks, but that's not our full offer, okay? Sometimes it can take several weeks. Sometimes it can take several months to get our inclusive financial aid award letter, letter that includes not only the scholarship, but also potentially need-based grants or, and we anticipate, or and I should say, that federal government direct student loan that's going to be for $5,500 the student's freshman year. And that's usually the telltale sign that this is the complete offer, that it includes any scholarship dollars and the federal direct student loan, or in some cases, just the federal direct student loan, if we didn't get any scholarships or need-based financial aid. Okay, so that's your clue that this is our kind of all-in award. But how we want you to leverage the platform, and this is even in the free version, and not all of this is live, but enough of it is live that it's very effective today, and the rest of it should be live in the next coming weeks. But you can upload your award here, and the first thing that we're going to help you do is just translate them, help you understand what's a grant, what's a scholarship, and ultimately, what's my net out-of-pocket cost going to be at any particular college. That's a step one. Let us assess and compare apples to apples. But what's more powerful than that, what I'm one of, the, this is one of the most excited features that, that we've been working on for a long time is it's gonna say, did you get a good award? It's gonna flag it if you are a great candidate for appeal for any number of reasons, but a lot of them is because we have, the technology is telling us you've been under awarded. So for example, Boston College, amazing institution and I can pick on them because they're in my backyard here, but they often under award families and it's typically by around $10,000. And of course that's unbeknownst to them, but we're a watchdog of sorts here and we're able to flag that, Hey, you should have got $10,000 more from BC. You're a great candidate for an appeal. Right. But even right now you can kind of fact check. What did we project at that college versus what did you actually get? Okay, and if we projected that you were going to get more than you did, that in and of itself is a great candidate for an appeal where we can say, hey, your net price calculator said we were going to get a $30,000 discount. We only got a $25,000 discount. We want to appeal for additional aid. Okay, so that's something that's um, I think is something that we're really excited about. And we just want to make sure that families understand what their again, did they get a award, great award here or not? Okay. Now, in terms of the X's and O's for appealing, I'm just going to tease this because this is, for the most part, all Peg and I will be coaching on starting in the next couple of weeks leading up till the beginning of April. How do we go get more money from these colleges? And we work with, we're really fortunate, right? And I think folks that work with us are really fortunate. We've got a lot of great currently employed financial aid counselors on our staff. The director of Harvard Medical School, financial aid, He's a part of our cap team. The director at MIT Sloan School of Management, Josh DeMail, he's a part of our cap team. And they have, they've been all over the place and they have very extensive networks. And we have a few other folks that have, are either currently employed or, or retired financial aid counselors. So it gives us this incredible intel into what's happening on that side of the fence. And we get this feedback from these committees that, a lot, that we're able to share with our 
families that we work with to, to, to help them figure out how to get more money or at least coach you in this way. So one of them is just bringing color to the story, right? Ryan will always tell us that, hey, my job is to get into our school by giving you as little as possible, not in a mean way, it's just how the business works, but enough in order to commit, but we're still making our margins, right? And I'm just crunching numbers and trying to do it, be a great employee, but it makes that so much harder for me when I found out the best day of your life was when your kid got accepted. The worst day was a couple of weeks later where you're thinking you might have to tell them they can't go to the school that they've earned, right? The right to attend, essentially. They did their end. They held up their end of the bargain. We want to ask for an additional amount, spoon feed these financial aid counselors, make life easy on them. This is why we always want to apply to competing schools. Now, when it comes to the timing of an appeal, sometimes we will wait until we've had additional awards so we can go ahead and take a competing college that might have offered more money or the same amount of money and leverage them against one another. It's a very effective tactic, especially if we're not eligible for need-based financial aid. Because who cares what my EFC is? If my kid wants to go to WPI, but their competitor in RPI gave a better award, I can say, I can bring that to the table. And almost certainly, at least in that example, with those two schools, you're going to be effective in getting more, right? Increasing that scholarship from the college, okay? Now, this is a little bit of inside baseball here. And I don't want to get too far in the weeds. That's what we're going to do when uh, over the coming weeks. Most of these private colleges, they want your taxes because they're going to make their own decisions on your write-offs, right? And oftentimes, you might have wrote off depreciation. That's fine with the IRS. It's not fine with the colleges. So they're going to hold that against you and give you less financial aid. If you can challenge them on that specifically, you got a great chance for an appeal, but you got to ask that question. And nobody knows to ask that question because they don't know the financial aid offices are doing that. That's some of the intel that we get having these guys a part of our team, okay? Of course, we want to be persistent, right? These people don't want to hear from you every day, but at the same time, we're being super kind. Or they'll remind us all the time that, guys, if I got somebody being a jerk to me or trying to play hardball with me, I'm just saying I don't want to work with this person for four more years. I don't want their kid coming here, right? Not that they're not going to be accepted. Again, that's not in play, but they're not going to be motivated to try to make it happen for you. And that's kind of where we want their headspace. I want to try to make it happen for this family because they've made it clear this is where they want to be and they are willing to make sacrifices. They just need a little bit more. And again, we want the student having a voice in this, especially if we're applying for additional merit-based scholarships. And that conversation is going to be happening with the admissions counselor, okay, in the admissions office. They are investing in the student. They're not investing in the parents right? They're investing in the student. That's who they've selected. That's the individual and human being that they want coming here. And if they can have a voice in this, that's going to maximize our odds of having a successful appeal here. So I think another helpful tidbit. So I'm teasing guys, I'm teasing kind of the information that the content that Peg and I are going to be hammering in the next couple of months. And I love it. This is like my favorite part of this process is this appeal part of the process. Yeah, we'll have several webinars that it just will go into details. We'll give you sample letters. We'll really go through all of it. What's the best way? Because there's some questions I'm answering in here about it. And if you want, Peggy, if you want, just want to show our kind of last slide here, call the action slide, and then maybe I'll share yeah. for time at the end. But here's the takeaways, guys. And we will say a version of this after every time that, that we speak. I think Peg and I's gets, anytime we get in front of somebody, is just stay engaged with us in some capacity. We feel very confident that families that are pretty plugged into what we're doing and the education resources we provide maximize their odds of having a successful end result, right? We've done this a bazillion times over. We have an incredible team. We have technology to support that. And we're trying to be that shepherd leading the charge here. And there's a few ways we do it. And a lot of them, I think, are totally free and are good enough right there, right? So one of them, just keep listening to our webinars, keep engaging in the material that we send you, create your free account if you haven't already. There's going to be a link on here on the slide deck, and maybe you can pop it in the chat too. Peg for office hours. Yeah, okay. I, just, it's, I just put it in there so you see it. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. So every other Monday at seven Eastern time, Peg, myself, some other folks on our team, different guests, et cetera. We just call them open office hours. We're just there to take live Q&A with, with, with families, with students, with counselors, wherever, with IECs, wh wherever you are in this ecosystem, 
So take advantage of that, right? Because it's a great free resource and bring your case studies. And to the extent that we can, we don't get to every question every Monday, but that's, I think, a great free resource, okay? Now, something else that, that we offer, obviously there's the paid version of the platform. That's $149 for the year, but we got a scholarship in, uh, in here for you, 15% off. If that's something you wanted to do, just, so just go to your MyCap account. If you wanted to upgrade, use the coupon code scholarship15. If you're thinking about doing that, what I would recommend is in addition to having access to the platform for a year, choose the Val Victorian option because that gets you the full access, but it gets you an hour with one of our experts. So that could be Peg, that could be myself, that could be Dan Bissig, that could be Ryan Callahan. He's at Harvard, Josh, who's at MIT. Anybody you end up with, if you're not happy with the hour you spend with them, request a full refund, say that I quoted that. It's recorded here and you'll have the recording and we will give it back, no questions asked. But I would book an hour. And especially if you want to talk about for right now, the most timely things that you'd want to talk about is you want us to weigh in on those award letters, right? Did we get a good deal, first of all? And how do we go back and do better? So what I would recommend is at least book your hour now. You can use it whenever you have access to the coupon code, and then you can meet with whomever you want whenever you're ready, whether that's now or a couple of weeks down the road, whatever you'd like. And Peg, I'll just share real quickly if I could. Sure. To give you a visual. If you already have an account, just the how for that is up here. You'll either hit upgrade or talk to an expert, and that's where you can book your time if you would like. And again, use that coupon code there. So that's for right now, for the class 2020, those are what I would recommend. You have your follow along, sign up for office hours, I recommend create a free account, even if you're doing this yourself, just to fact check that I get a good deal here. And you understand if you want to work with us above that, hopefully how to make that happen here and, and hopefully a discount that's worthwhile for you. If you're an underclassman, the last kind of way that people can work with us is what we call our kind of wake me when it's over service where you work with somebody one-on-one -on -one from end to end, right? So we actually do these financial aid applications for you. We do the FAFSA and CSS. We help put together a list of schools. We're on the front lines for appealing for more scholarships or aid, and we're helping you figure out how to pay for this whole thing. So it's a concierge service. And again, for you class 2020, I think it's probably not for everybody, but in most cases too late that this investment would make sense because it's a whole lot more, right? It's 3,000 bucks or 29.99. But if you're an underclassman, this would be a consideration for you all. And I'll just pop some of the details into the chat here. So you guys can take a look at it. If you're interested at all, this is some details about that, that service, right? But that coupon code will still apply if you use it. So in something like five, 15% off of the 3,000 is fairly meaningful. So that's again, the last option that people have to engage us that's the opposite of the free end of the spectrum but for some families it makes sense so i think those are my biggies peggy and by the way phenomenal questions today so we got a pretty well versed yeah i'm going i'm going mock 10 here yeah all good stuff and a lot of the stuff about appeals hold on to those because like i just said we're gonna do a whole hour on appeals we're gonna tell you our process how we do it, how you should approach it. Hold tight for that one. You're on our list. Just like I said earlier about paying attention to your email, just pay attention to your email, just like we want our kids to, and you'll get those invites. And then, yeah, you can hop on. They're all recorded. So if it's not a time that works for you, just register. I do that all the time personally. And then I just listen to it when it's convenient for me. Just keep keep in, you, you want to make sure with appeals that you're appealing as soon as it makes sense so that the college has time to get back to you. You have time to assess all of the different responses so that you can make a decision. Because ideally you want to hear back from an appeal before you're making a decision. Somebody put in, can you appeal if we've already accepted? Yes. We would recommend for people that haven't accepted yet to hold off you lose leverage, right? If they know you already put in a deposit, they might be thinking they're going to come anyway. So we don't really have to be as generous. They're not going to tell you that. If you put yourself in their shoes, it makes sense, right? Absolutely. All right. I, I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions because, you know, no we can't, we don't, yeah, we can't, yeah, we, we do our best. We give it our best effort. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, if you have questions about how to, 
how we can support you or anything, you can always shoot an email to support at collegeaidpro.com. We have a team that just responds to those emails and we'll get back to you within a business day. Absolutely. If we don't reach out to us personally, we'll make sure it happens and we'll find out why you didn't hear from us. So we're very intentional about responding to our support email. All right. Good to see I'll some see of you on here that I know, and it seems like it's been really helpful. So I'm glad we are overjoyed to hear that. Got and, some nice compliments uh, today, Peg. I feel like we got some nice compliments today. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Always that like. keeps us going, guys. So thanks for that. Thanks for that. Sometimes we get lost in what day is it and which webinar are we doing? <laughs> we love doing this. It, yeah. It's just, we're getting into big season now. We're getting into the fun time and a lot of stuff going on. So definitely stay in touch with us, hop on office hours and just keep the ball rolling. Don't just say, oh, this is a great webinar and put it on your pile in your busy life. You really, from a parent to parents, you don't want to do that. You want to stay engaged so that you're an informed consumer in this process. Peggy, so on that note. See you in two go minutes, pal. Go get, you, go get a two minute break. You deserve it. Yeah, I know. We have a meeting at 10. All right, guys. Have a great rest of the day and we'll see you soon. Take care.